Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Maarten van Beek. I work for TNO in the Netherlands, where I focus on uh, policy advice uh, on sustainable mobility. Uh, I do this for different levels of government, ranging from cities and national governments uh, and also uh, the European Commission. And today I will give a presentation on. Let's see, get it in presentation mode. Yes, strategies for a future proof charging infrastructure network. So uh, over the last years, um, uh, based on different studies that we have done, uh, we concluded that battery electric vehicles will very likely be the most cost effective drivetrains of the future. Uh, for passenger cars, uh, we see already that a bit depending on the way that vehicles are being used, uh, electric vehicles already have a lower TCO than equivalent um, petrol or diesel vehicles. Uh, we are already, let's say, in an upscaling phase. For the heavy duty vehicles, uh, being trucks and buses, we are more in a market introduction phase. So the vehicles are not that widely available yet. And it, um, um, it also will probably take some time before uh, the battery electric trucks are uh, have a lower TCO than their equivalent diesel vehicles. We do expect that by 2030, this will actually be the case uh, for most types of trucks and most types of deployment of these trucks. Um, so uh, on, in, in the figures on the on the right, um, first on the top right, you see the amount of battery electric vehicles that would be required in the Netherlands uh, up to 2050 to realize a climate neutral mobility system by then. Um, and on the bottom right, the amount of chargers that would be uh, required to facilitate those vehicles. Um, this is actually the amount that has to be realized per working day. And as you can see, between 2030 and 2035, uh, up to, let's say, 1600 chargers per day would have to be realized to facilitate the, uh, the electric vehicle fleet. And actually for the Netherlands, that is a, um, a that is really a lot. Um, these calculations are uh, based on the assumption that vehicles will more or less be used as they are being used now. Uh, so assuming that most of them will be privately owned, for instance. Uh, and also uh, that there will be no, let's say, game changers in the way that we charge vehicles. So they will, uh, of course, the, the charging uh, power may increase, um, but we assume that the, um, the types of chargers, so um, like a physical connection between the charger and the vehicle uh, will still be required. So let's say conventional uh, types of charging. Um, here I show a formula um, uh, that enables us to determine what the demand for charging infrastructure um, will be in a given location. And uh, this is the result of the uh, electricity demand uh, in the given location uh, and the electricity that is provided per charger. And to decompose this a bit further, the electricity demand uh, in a given location is the result of um, um, the energy consumption of vehicles, uh, the energy, uh, the vehicle deployment, so the kilometers that vehicles drive per day, uh, and the amount of vehicles. Uh, and of course, the electricity that is charged elsewhere uh, does not need to be charged in this given location that we are looking at now. Uh, so this together makes the energy demand in the given location um, and then we divide this by um, the uh, the charging power uh, and the uh, effective occupancy rate of the charger. This is really uh, the amount of hours that the charger is being used effectively. Um, now, what we see in the future is that um, uh, we expect various uh, new technologies to emerge uh, and also uh, for people to use their vehicles in a different way uh, and also for cost of technologies to change. And this will also affect the amount of chargers that are required in, in a given location. <clears throat> so I show some examples here in, uh, in orange. Due to the uh, lower 
operational cost of electric vehicles in the future, we expect that the, the, the vehicles will be uh, used more intensively. Uh, so their, um, the amount of kilometers per day per vehicle uh, actually increases, and this will increase the demand for, uh, for charging infrastructure. Um, also, if vehicles can be driven autonomously, um, then this will make driving more attractive uh, and will also increase um, the deployment of the vehicles and therefore require uh, more charging infrastructure. Um, further to the right, um, new technologies such as electric road systems. Um, this is a catenary system that allows vehicles to be charged while driving, uh, but also technologies like, like battery swapping or affordable high power charging um, may result in uh, a shift in the location where vehicles are being charged um, and therefore also affect the amount of charges that are uh, required in the given location. Uh, the same holds for autonomous driving. If vehicles can drive themselves to, uh, to a charging location, then they can drive actually to a location uh, in which uh, v uh, the charging is relatively cheap. Um, and therefore, um, more charges will be required in these locations compared to, um, well, the given location that, the, that we were looking at. Um, uh, as a last example, um, on, the, on the bottom right, um, vehicle to grid uh, is a technology uh, that uh, allows for bi-directional charging. So vehicles can be charged from the grid, but also at certain times uh, vehicles could provide the, uh, the electricity uh, in the battery uh, back to the grid um, when there is a uh, when the, the the demand on the grid is, is higher than the uh, than the supply and vehicles could actually um, function as a buffer in the uh, in the energy system um, but this allow this this requires vehicles to be connected to the grid uh, very, well as much as possible also when they are not charging uh, they need to be connected so that they can maybe provide electricity back into the grid um, and this lower occupancy rate requires um, more chargers. Um, this really only focuses on the amount of chargers, of course. Uh, also, um, certain technologies may result in a different physical characteristics of chargers. Um, this is, uh, I mentioned this below, uh, for instance, inductive charging. Um, if this really um, uh, develops fast, then uh, maybe um, uh, in the future, it would be preferable to have more um, locations where you can charge inductively and you don't have to uh, connect the vehicles um, physically uh, with a cable um, uh, to the charger. Um, so what, what we have now done is really look from an end user perspective. Um, what the, the amount of charging infrastructure that would be uh, preferable. Uh, on the other hand, of course, there are different perspectives. Uh, in this case, uh, looking at the perspective from, let's say, societal perspective or a governmental perspective, uh, maybe realizing charging infrastructure in a given location is not the primary objective, uh, or even maybe uh, maybe undesirable uh, due to a lack of physical space or a lack of uh, of grid capacity, um, or maybe. Um, 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 to let's say increase the livability of, of, of certain areas. We don't want too much uh, mobility there and therefore uh, also not too much uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, and to really um, weigh, weigh these different um, uh, these different goals or ob objectives uh, from a societal perspective, it is important that governments take a coordinating role. Um, so to really uh, determine um, where and where we will not be able to realize charging infrastructure. And of course, governments have also quite some levers to uh, roll out this infrastructure. For instance, they can provide permits in certain locations where um, infrastructure can be realized and maybe uh, not provide permits in locations where there is not enough space or grid capacity available. Um, also, they can differentiate, differentiate price um, to make charging cheaper in locations where 
uh, space and grid capacity is available and make it more expensive in locations where we do not want to realize charging infrastructure. Um, so as I now explained, on the one hand, we need a very fast uptake of chargers to facilitate the uh, fleet of electric vehicles. On the other hand, we see that there are quite some uncertainties um, in terms of the development of technologies, development of, uh, of cost, and also uh, the way that uh, uh, people use vehicles. Um, and this has the risk of, uh, of a technology lock-in. Um, so if we uh, roll out the charging infrastructure based on what we know now, uh, then we may end up with a charging infrastructure network that does not meet um, uh, the demands of the future. So maybe the chargers are not in the right locations, or maybe um, the, the physical characteristics of the chargers um, are not future proof. Um, and this really calls for an adaptive uh, rollout strategy. So the strategy should uh, be able to be adapted according to uh, changes in cost, technologies or vehicle behavior. Um, also, as I already mentioned, it is important for governments to really take a coordinating role. Um, for instance, to make sure that there is a good geographical coverage of, uh, of charging infrastructure so that it also is available in locations that may be uh, less profitable um, from a CPO perspective. Uh, but we know that also in locations with, well, lower uh, population densities, charging infrastructure would be required also for those people <clears throat> to be able to make the shift to electric vehicles. Another uh, reason for this coordinating role is to make sure that um, CPOs act in line with um, uh, societal goals when it comes to uh, grid congestion. Uh, for instance, uh, you do not want CPOs to um, provide um, electricity from the vehicle back into the grid uh, in locations or at times where uh, the grid is already congested. Um, on the other hand, you do want them to supply energy back into the grid when that is preferable. Um, so really, it is up to governments to make sure that CPOs actually uh, act in uh, in a way um, uh, that is in line with uh, societal goals. So at TNO, we provide various services to governments um, to realize such an uh, adaptive rollout strategy. Uh, for instance, we uh, do assessments of technology uh, in which we try to determine the potential of new technologies such as electric road systems uh, or battery swapping. We also try to uh, determine um, what share vehicles will fast charge and what share of vehicles will uh, use normal or slow charging. Um, we also determine uh, the uh, the potential of new mobility trends such as autonomous driving or uh, shared vehicles uh, and the way that those affect um, uh, the way that vehicles are being used. Um, we make um, configurations of the mobility system and um, and the energy system. Um, well, we, we model these uh, to see um, how they interact and uh, to what extent they um, uh, are able to cope with uh, uh, changes that are expected in the future. And lastly, we collaborate with governments to really develop and implement these uh, adaptive rollout strategies. We do this using different tools. Um, the first tool being Urban Strategy. This is a, a digital twin for uh, urban developments. This has a focus on mobility. Um, we also uh, developed a tool called SIM. Uh, this is more or less a digital twin of the uh, of the energy system um, and allows, for instance, um, more insights in um, whether a grid can cope with a demand where there is a mismatch uh, where and when uh, the grid is overloaded um, and also how the grid can be changed to uh, to facilitate the demand 
And lastly, we also have uh, adaptive uh, policy frameworks. This is more uh, uh, like a governance tool, uh, and this is used to uh, really work together with governments to implement uh, certain types of policies. So the three main takeaways from this presentation. Uh, firstly, um, the charging infrastructure rollout needs to be uh, adaptive. Uh, to uh, take account of uh, changes in technology, uh, cost and uh, vehicle use. Also, governments should take a coordinating role to prioritize social goals. Um, so, for instance, related to the use of physical space, uh, the use of uh, grid capacity uh, to make sure that the geographical coverage uh, is good and also um, to uh, have charging be affordable for everybody. Uh, and lastly, to make sure that uh, uh, the CPOs act in line uh, with societal goals when it comes to grid congestion. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, it is important for governments to provide alternatives uh, for those uh, for whom electric vehicles are not yet an option. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, better public transport or, uh, or cycling uh, networks. Um, so this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, here you are. As I said, my details are, are here in the presentation. So if you want to contact me later, uh, feel free to. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, for your insightful um, uh, uh, for your insights. It directly complements this webinar's focus as well. There's one question from uh, Wim from Rijkswaterstaat. He he has a question on what about fee to age? Do you have do you have an answer on on, on his question? V to age? Yep. So vehicle to to house. Yeah, Wim, uh, could you just uh, explain your question a little bit more? Because I understand vehicle to house is what you mean. Could uh, you? Vehicle to home is uh, is the actual yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. name uh, of it. Um, uh, vehicle to home. Uh, I think that there's a, a, a lot of uh, possibilities on uh, on that side, but I uh, don't see, uh, Martin, that you have it in your uh, presentation. Uh, do you, can you say something about it? Um, yes, I think I'm now again sharing my screen. Um, um, so vehicle to home, it is in so I, I could have put like vehicle to X um, here instead of vehicle to grid. Um, right. This also. Um, um, uh, it, um, we expect it, of course, to, to be an important to play an important role in the future. Of course, uh, it is mainly focused on people that have their own um, have access to their own roof, uh, have their own uh, parking spot available near their house. Uh, I, for instance, live in an apartment in Amsterdam. For me, this is not relevant, uh, but of course, uh, for many houses, this can be. Uh, and we know that it is a very cost effective way uh, for users to use their vehicles. Um, uh, and also it need not be a very expensive technology, uh, so we expect this to play an important role. Um, it is, of course, the question um, how people will use this. Uh, if you really use your vehicle to commute to work, then uh, your vehicle is not at home when the sun shines. Uh, so then you need an extra battery for storage uh, during the day. But that, of course, adds to the cost of this system. Uh, so then the question is um, for whom this is really cost effective. It is mainly cost effective for the people that have their car during the day while the sun is shining um, on their park uh, on their parking lots. So um, uh, it is something that we're going to look into, like who, who really uh, benefits from that system. Uh, but also for us, it's an important question. How does this affect the um, uh, the redistribution of welfare, uh, for instance, because this is really uh, these are already people um, with more financial means uh, because they apparently have uh, their own house with their own roof, uh, with their own driveway. There are mainly bigger houses, so there are uh, people uh, with, well, uh, relatively much um, uh, wealth. Uh, and then they also have uh, cheaper access to electricity and therefore cheaper access to mobility in the future um, compared to people that uh, live in an uh, apartment, uh, maybe social housing. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, rely on public and, and therefore more expensive charging infrastructure. So the, this is really 
uh, it has multiple aspects. So on one way, it affects the uh, the amount of charges that we need, but it also affects um, the way uh, that mobility costs are redistributed. So it is a very um, important technology for the future uh, and also something um, uh, that governments really uh, have to look into and um, um, adapt their uh, strategies to uh, accordingly. Um, right. So it's uh, right. it's very interesting. Yep. So it's a, Wim, it, does, does it answer it, it, your question, Wim? Sorry, because yeah, in, in just yeah. in sake of time, because we've got one oh. question more left. Is it yeah, is it sure, sufficient enough, sure. or do you want to uh, talk some more with no, Martin I, afterwards? I, I, I wonder what uh, what the capacity is uh, on on vehicle to home. Uh, as you say, uh, uh, you need to have uh, uh, the, the proper homes uh, and the proper facilities. But uh, I think there's a lot of capa capacity in 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 that case. Uh, I rest my case. Thank you very much okay. for the question. Yes, Thank you. Will, Thank we will you. Study this further, so I will. Uh, I, we will be in touch at some point. Thanks. Okay. Um, I've got another qu quick question, Juliet. Um, um, uh, please answer. Uh, just ask your question yeah. in. Um, or you put it in the chat. You can. You can ask. Uh, you can ask yourself. Okay. Yes. My question is: um, How feasible is the? Um, um, the development of, or the aim of 1600 charging points a day regarding um, the grid mm -hmm. capacity. And um, I miss the developments on hydrogen um, and the grid capacity. You, you, you look into the personal mobility um, um, situation. But um, when trucks get uh, more electrical, it means that they need heavier loading capacity or charging capacity. So how do you see that? Uh, I think were those were those three questions. <laughs> uh, let's let's go them through them one by one. So um, uh, what I what I could have done. I mean, this presentation was on uh, on charging infrastructure. So therefore, I focus on electric vehicles. Um, uh, I think I, I could have put uh, energy um, uh, energy instead of electricity here. So then it would also have included hydrogen. So if you would have charged hydrogen, of course, you need less charging infrastructure. Um, it is something that we um, that we really focus on. So what is, what do we ex do we expect to be uh, the main drivetrain technologies in the further future? Um, uh, we see that battery electric will be the most cost effective technology for everybody. Uh, however, uh, there may be some uh, applications for which uh, battery electric vehicles uh, or battery electric technology um, uh, may not fit or it may not be able to uh, replace the uh, the vehicles and, uh, and the deployment one on one. So heavy trucks that drive uh, long distances uh, for them, it may be more difficult to uh, switch to um, uh, to a battery electric vehicles. Um, although um, there are also within uh, battery electric drivetrains other options you can uh, swap trailers um, over uh, multiple um, trucks um, ers is maybe an option uh, so for long distances to be connected to the grid while driving um, like like trains are um, hydrogen is of course also an option um, we are really looking into that um, we expect it not to be as cost effective, uh, but maybe uh, we will need it in the further future. Uh, but then, of course, we also need a, a completely new, um, 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 well, uh, uh, infrastructure network for hydrogen. It's already there. We have a, a grid for electricity. We don't have it for hydrogen yet. Uh, and this is where it becomes really difficult for hydrogen. Uh, how do how will we transport hydrogen uh, to those uh, to those locations? Uh, it's very expensive to do it by trucks. Uh, it's expensive to do it by uh, by pipelines. You can do it. Um, 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 Produce the hydrogen locally at the char at the uh, refueling station, but then you need uh, quite much um, storage for hydrogen, and that is also expensive. So, especially the the distribution and storage of hydrogen is expensive, uh, and therefore we expect it to be not as cost effective. Uh, but still, we may need it in the future. So, uh, our message is always: uh, do not aim for one technology only. Um, um, 
make sure you're also your strategy uh, or this strategy is adaptive. So if we it turns out that we need hydrogen, make sure that you can scale up quickly. Uh, so make sure that the permits are there, that you know where the refueling stations um, may need to be in the future. So make sure that you're prepared to uh, so you're able to roll out quickly if uh, if necessary. That's my vision on on hydrogen. Other, other, your question was threefold. What, what was the other one again? Um, well, um, well, I, I, I asked you about grid capacity and if uh, mm. trucks were going to yeah. be more electrical. Um, yeah. How feasible is this? Because they need yeah. heavier loading capacities. Yes. Okay. Uh, can I can I butt in just a little bit because of the time, uh, Juliette and Martin. Um, maybe you can discuss this later on uh, yes. um, because we've got like four speakers coming. Yes. Um, so I, I wrote down your email, uh, Martin. I'll yeah. send okay. you next. Yeah, I can. I can and also answer it in one in, in one sentence. We uh, we know that for eighty percent of the uh, of the future battery electric trucks, if it, well, <clears> if they become battery electric, we know that for eighty percent of the trucks. It will be uh, a problem uh, on the midterm uh, for them to uh, to charge at their own depots because there is not enough grid capacity available. And thanks, thanks, Marta. Thanks for your presentation and your insight. Thanks, Wim and Juliet, for the questions. Um, our next speaker, uh, Job, is um, addressing these last two questions as well. So, Job, you can start your presentation if you're ready. Yeah, indeed. I was I was uh, biting on my tongue in this uh, discussion. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and thanks for all the all the questions. Indeed, um, I, I'm gonna take you uh, on yeah this this wild ride of um, uh, combining mobility and energy in the uh, in the light of electrical vehicles. Um, and indeed, why why your role uh, as an inter traffic audience with sometimes uh, watches these uh, issues in the grids and then thinks hey, that's that's uh, uh, very challenging, but not really my my problem. Uh, why your role in this might very well be uh, essential in solving this. Um, my name is Job Spoolstra. I'm an innovation manager on behalf of Technolution. Uh, I think much of the um, mobility and uh, inter-traffic audience will know us from the network mobility management point of view, the platform that we provide for traffic management centers across the Netherlands and Scandinavia and the US for um, uh, optimizing um, uh, road infrastructure in, in all kinds of digital manners using uh, digitalization, our own sensors, stuff like that. But uh, most of you will not know that we're also very active with Dutch um, uh, grid operators uh, across the whole country in uh, digitalizing their grids, modeling them and simulating them. And indeed, most of the the, um, the the news that you might hear in Dutch context on uh, grid overcapacity, so the congestion issues uh, are calculated through the, the tools that we um, develop on behalf of these um, grid operators. So um, when I, oops, sorry, I'm, um, I'm watching the wrong screen here. So um, uh, um, uh, the the mobility uh, part and the energy part uh, trying to come together uh, within technolution. Um, and when I look towards um, uh, urban mobility, uh, uh, indeed, I see some some uh, trends that are promoting um, electric mobility quite effectively. So um, some developments that we're into are uh, increased uh, connectivity for the vehicles uh, being able to uh, um, uh, communicate way better, and also municipalities starting out all kinds of uh, virtual zoning, so geofences, zero emission zones, pedestrian zones, uh, and um, uh, implementing them across uh, Europe. Um, and uh, one example of this is the uh, implementation that we provided in Gothenburg, where the municipality is uh, able to activate a digital zero emission zone based on real-time air quality measures. Um, uh, so activating such a zero emission zone in a dig digital manner and communicating this towards hybrid vehicles of Volvo, for example, where drivers entering this zone get a pop-up of please switch to electric mode at this point in time, or if you're not able to, please uh, know that you are not allowed to drive into this zone at the moment because you're driving a fossil fuel drivetrain. Well, all these developments that we see and, and a lot of policy um, uh, efforts around it uh, indeed are promoting electric vehicles quite effectively. So this is the prognosis that we see for the Netherlands at the moment, the yellow line being the amount of electric vehicles uh, expected to um, uh, hit um, uh, our streets in the next few years and the bar chart, um, the, the related charging infrastructure needed for those um, vehicles. And this is only a private vehicle. So indeed logistics are even on top of that, um, uh, which is 
challenging because uh, if we watch these charging points, we often um, see these charging points uh, standing around um, in the streets and we often tend to forget that there's quite a, a world uh, underneath. So indeed, from a mobility perspective and maybe the more inter-traffic perspective, we look at these um, uh, charging points from a viewpoint of how can we conveniently locate them, um, how can we align them with uh, mobility demands, so where will people travel, where will people uh, want to charge their vehicles, and how can we cope with peak demands, because everyone wants to charge at the same time and then they're all occupied. Well, from the energy uh, domain, so when we look towards electricity grid operators, um, we look at these charging points from a, a different perspective. So how can we fit them into our grid? So both geographically, do I have the cables there? But indeed also over the viewpoint of this overcapacity, this congestion. How can, I how can I align EV charging with solar and wind? That's uh, increasing in, in our grids. And also how can we peak, uh, uh, cope with this peak demand? Because indeed everyone charging at the same time means uh, um, uh, a peak in uh, demand capacity uh, uh, from our grids. And just to show you, so th these worlds might feel very much apart but just to show you how aligned they are and that we're really looking from two perspectives to the same problem um, uh, here you see on the top right the um, uh, intensity of traffic at the dutch highways in a in a business day so a morning rush hour and an evening rush hour across the day and you see in the electricity grid uh, the same perspective but then um, uh, on the orange line uh, people all trying to connect their electric vehicle at charging points near offices uh, and the blue line uh, people trying to charge their car at residential area, so coming home and then indeed trying to charge a car. Um, so diving more into this energy perspective, what does this world look like and why does it um, relate to the world of inter-traffic? Well, these grids, what do you get if you combine these exponential uh, growth curves annually? So for electric vehicles, but also for solar panels, heat pumps, uh, electrification of industry. Um, uh, and if you combine this with uh, our electricity grids that are um, uh, developed for a life cycle of more than 30 years, so not really keeping up with all these exponential growth curves, well, you get roughly this picture. We saw it before from the presentation of TNO. This is a picture that the grid operators show uh, uh, geographically. What are your chances of getting a new connection for industry um, uh, if you want to have a new logistics center, for example? Well, uh, red and orange really mean uh, no. Uh, and, and yellow very much also means the same. So um, uh, it's uh, 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 these are very difficult um, uh, places in the Netherlands. And as you see, it, it crosses the whole of the Netherlands in getting a new uh, connection on uh, larger um, uh, uh, larger industrial connections, but this is expected to also arrive at residential areas and office areas, for example. And when I show this picture to an international audience, the, the comment might very well be, so this red line stops at the Dutch border, so uh, this uh, seems to be a Dutch issue. I'm, I'm afraid it's not really. We see the uh, um, uh, issues popping up across uh, uh, Western Europe uh, and in the US uh, as well. Uh, this is very much a development that's coming towards urbanized areas in general. Um, and very much relates to well, all our um, uh, um, uh, backgrounds. And what we do with the grid operators is at least validating the data that they have on what's happening in my grid. So here, for example, we see the yellow houses being registered in a Dutch registry of solar panels um, and the DSO being able to check um, so is this actually the case? Do these uh, houses actually have solar panels? And here you'll see uh, one yellow uh, house being uh, registered as having solar panels, but its neighbor uh, also having placed these rotor panels, but apparently forgot or did not uh, register them in the registry. And therefore, um, the DSO really doesn't understand too much what assets are connected to my grid and what's all happening in my grid. So the first step that we try to help these grid operators in at least validating the data that they have at this point in time, so what's connected in my grid for now, but we also do this to provide the, them with scenario calculations for the future. So um, an important thing that we do on behalf of uh, e-mobility is that we get uh, quarterly updated location prognoses from the Dutch grid operators on where do we expect electric vehicles to be located in 2030 and 2050. Uh, and also we expect them to have a different charging pattern than they do now because uh, of different technologies, different mobility behavior, different charging locations. So we get quarterly updated charging profiles for 2030 and 2050 as well and combining them and th these are uh, also including data that we get from TNO the the, the previous uh, speaker um, uh, and we're also able to uh, um, 
uh, get that into our grid modeling system. So here you see, for example, the calculation of a current scenario. So this is the current status where you see two different cables in a residential area being under pressure or being uh, close to overcapacity. But then if we look towards a 2030 scenario already, we see um, that almost half of this residential area gets uh, a, a problematic for uh, getting new um, uh, connections and new uh, 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 power uh, uh, into the grid. So also connecting new electrical vehicles for charging, for example. So this would mean that for this 2030 scenario, work has to happen on this part of the residential area if we want to keep up with um, new demand for charging electrical vehicles. Well, this seems like quite a serious problem in the Netherlands at least, but why is your role important in this and why can we make a difference? Well, two different aspects, one being this is not a static problem, this capacity. It's a very local problem. Some neighborhoods have this, some other neighborhoods do not have uh, a high risk of congestion. And we see this um, as we did with a lot of our research partners. Uh, all the residential areas in the Netherlands, we uh, um, got back to eight different archetypes of residential areas. So these are the eight um, uh, areas uh, uh, located on the right and on the left you see some larger cities in the Netherlands where these areas are placed in the city. And if I add a risk pattern to this, if we talk about this overcapacity, this congestion, we see a large difference in some of these areas having a high risk for additional demand. So that means if you want to get a new connection for uh, 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 getting new energy into your home, so for charging your vehicle, for example, that's problematic, in uh, especially in older uh, areas. Um, but we also see, so for example, in detached housing, uh, the, the, the vrijstaande woningen in Dutch um, that have their own uh, solar panels and that might want more. Well, there's also a congestion risk of adding, so the supply, adding more energy into the grid, which might mean problems. But here you see there's a large difference in which specific residential area you locate these charging points. So location is a very important issue in uh, choosing infrastructure. Um, and then also it's a timing problem. It's not a static problem in a way, um, but for example, if we look towards a scenario of 2030 for these detached houses, so these vrijstaande woningen in a winter day, you see that the red line is the maximum capacity of the transformer is a in a residential area. And you see in the evening, so starting at uh, five o'clock in the evening, uh, this transformer is getting um, uh, uh, over capacity uh, because uh, of people arriving at home, charging their vehicle, um, heating up their house, uh, 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 electrical cooking, uh, putting on the lights. Um, and especially in the winter day, this this heat part uh, demands a lot of energy and also charging your battery is uh, is uh, 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 requires more energy. Um, um, so uh, if we then look towards this same residential area in 2030, but on a summer day, you see that this congestion in the evening is still there, but it's quite low because um, uh, charging is more efficient. Uh, uh, the heating of a house uh, requires less energy, uh, but you see a new type of congestion popping up, which is all these solar panels uh, on these houses that in a summer day all push this energy into the grid and uh, over um, uh, uh, overpowering this transformer uh, in another way. So you see it's, um, it's a problem that changes over the year. Uh, but also changes across the day. And this means that, for example, this supply uh, congestion very much fits into if you can put this energy into your in, into your uh, car instead of pushing it into the grid, then we can solve this issue already. Um, so um, why is your role important in this? Well, um, three parts. Uh, if we want to scale up electrical charging infrastructure in the Netherlands, but also in urban areas across uh, Europe uh, uh, and the US, um, uh, we have to have an integrated approach between this mobility part and also the energy capacity part. Th these are married to each other and cannot be unseen um, uh, separate from each other. Um, uh, one is that this location aspect is very important and that is something that a grid operator cannot influence, but you can. The inter-traffic audience knows where do vehicles go and we know how we can influence behavior in um, choosing your parking location, for example. So this location aspect is a very important one that a grid operator has no uh, say in, but you do. 
So that's a very important one. And also this timing aspect, in a way a grid operator has impact in this because you have these uh, smart charging uh, technologies so that you can shift this charging transaction to another point in time. So in that regard, they do have influence in this, but indeed if we are working around reducing uh, rush hour peaks, indeed uh, uh, if we are trying to get people to shift to a different mode uh, or have a different mobility behavior, we also have an impact on this timing issue. And these two aspects we really have to understand better because uh, uh, the role of the mobility domain in changing these aspects is vital. Um, that's my um, uh, pitch for today. Um, uh, please be welcome to our booth at uh, InterTraffic. Um, and for any questions, I'm uh, I'm happy to discuss either now or over email. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Jörg, for your presentation and integrating mobility and um... Uh, the, the challenge of mobility and, and energy. It's a challenge. There are challenges for Dutch, but also on urban uh, uh, strategies as well. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you also for looking at the time because we uh, uh, we, we are stressed out a little bit. Uh, so uh, Jose, I just want to call out uh, your presentation and your insights on scaling uh, electrification in 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 Europe with a focus on the Netherlands and the solution Royal does, uh, Ask Coding has. So, Jose, if you're ready, please um, take the stage. Of course. Thank you very much, Mariah. And we'll try to look at the time as much as possible. Um, I'm already glad to hear that um, some things Martin already told you and Job told you are coming together in my slides. So our story makes sense. Um, I'm Jose van der Plaat. I'm working as an advisor uh, sustainable mobility for Royal Oscar in DHV and as well as the role as business uh, owner of our solution called uh, Volt, which I'm going to tell you a bit more about in the upcoming, let's say, eight minutes. Um, but first, I want to look at the uh, bigger picture of the challenge we're facing on a European level, is that we are uh, aiming for a reduction in CO2 emissions um, caused by electric cars in 2030. Uh, by 50%, uh, depends a bit on the country, depending on EV market share and EV market uh, adoption. But in general, it means that it is expected that we need to uh, speed up this rollout process by nine times if we want to reach the goals that have been set in the infrastructure master plan um, from the European Union. Um, and in numbers, this means that we uh, need to make uh, speed. Uh, we need about 6.8 million charge points in Europe in 2030. Um, we're now building about 2,000 charging stations a week, where we should build about 14,000 charge stations a week. And to make sure we can guide this process, and, and what Marta told you as well, just keep in mind the societal goals and not blindly look at the implementation of public charging infrastructure. It's very important to plan this process uh, ahead. So you, in one end, you can keep up the pace, but you can do this in a structured uh, manner as well. Um, if you look a bit more at the Netherlands, we are one of the front runners. Um, together with Germany, about 50% of all charging public charging locations in Europe are lake located in the Netherlands and Germany. Um, and in the Netherlands, um, it's quite a challenge because there we have, uh, of course, a very limited amount of space. We're a small country and we would like to use our public space for another uh, variety of functions, uh, let's say walking, cycling, um, climate adaptive solutions, other uh, functions that are needed to guide the mobility transition in general, um, where uh, going to electric is a part uh, of the bigger puzzle. A um, bit more in detail about the Netherlands, uh, currently about 140,000 uh, semi-public charge points, um, amount of electric cars, and the ambition. So in the upcoming five to six years, we expect to grow to 400,000 public charging points uh, in the Netherlands, which is already very challenging looking at the amount of available public space uh, and certainly in the more dense areas, 
um, in the Netherlands. We have developed a tool at Railscom DHV to support governments uh, to gu in guiding this process to build our network um, towards 2030-2035, a bit of a shorter horizon than Marta told you about. Um, but we can support them by using Vault. Um, it's the name of our software solution uh, where we are able to combine uh, a various amount of data layers um, to find the right spot or to find the right location for your charging infrastructure. And we can build up a network towards the expected amount of charging stations in 2030, 2035. We, are, we can tune these numbers um, and we can keep in mind those societal goals. We can, can keep in mind to make, uh, uh, to save room for walking, uh, that charging infrastructure is not blocking um, the roads that we keep in mind, the, the room for cycling that we keep in mind, uh, room for climate adaptive solutions. Um, all different data layers that we can combine together uh, to make one structured network, um, which is accessible, safe, reliable, in line with demand and in fit with the public space. And we have done this quite well for the last couple of years. Here you see in this graph, we have a very little amount of area and a very large amount of public charging infrastructure. And we believe that one of the reasons why we are able to do this um, is because we plan, we take control, we plan our network, we build according, accordingly to it. Um, so Volt can help you scale the rollout of your product charging infrastructure and it helps you to guide you um, to reach a various amount of goals and it contributes to structured network planning, efficient use of resources because you know what's coming up at least until 2030, 2035. Um, you can make sure your layout is optimal, walking distances are in line, um, and accessibility is well taught. And of course, this is done with proven technology. To find the right location, we use uh, a various amount of algorithms. Um, and of course, we keep the product in line with what the market expects from us. So there's continuous development going on. And the key takeaways, I think, in this is take control. Um, as Mark already told you, in general, the, the government has a broader view on what's going on in their public space. They have several societal goals to keep in mind. And a good charging infrastructure network can be one of those goals, but should be in line with the others. Um, plan ahead. So make sure uh, there is a network available for people who are uh, using it, but also who are willing to use it or are going to use it in the near future. So don't wait until people are asking for a charging location. Make sure there is already a charging location available. And think multimodal as well. Um, there's a lot of attention for uh, private use, but we see more and more groups switching to uh, elect going electric, such as uh, cabs, logistics, uh, specialized transport. Um, all of them at some point in time will make use of the network that's available. Um, so don't blindly stare on the growth of private electric vehicles, but keep in mind but when building your network, keep in mind also the other target groups. And of course, we're ready to help you out. If you would like to hear more about Volt, please join my session at the InterTraffic. If you're not able to come to the InterTraffic, then of course, get in touch, um, look at our website or send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for this uh, quick and uh, insightful presentation, um, showing us the emphasis on proactive planning. Uh, and uh, if you not really mean multi multimodal, but it's our it's our little bridge to our next presenter, 
uh, Pascal, it's not multi-model on, on EV, but uh, multi, multi-model on a different perspective, and it's active mobility. So if you're ready, uh, Pascal, and thanks again, Jose. Pascal, it's your turn. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Pascal Willems. I work for Cowchapel, and I'm an urban mobility planner. And I was asked uh, to talk about planning for active mode uh, related to stumps. I'm going to start with the... Um, let me see. Yes, um, with some challenges that our cities are facing today, and I think Jose kind of touched upon that already. Um, we are struggling with finding space. Uh, our cities are becoming more dense. Um, and if you see the amount of space that, uh, for example, cars uh, take compared to active modes, I think you can see that we are um, doing something wrong right now with planning in our cities. Cars take up so much space. Um, and I believe that we can really um, move forward if we start uh, planning more for active modes, meaning uh, pedestrians and cycling. And I think uh, especially the figure on the right is also quite interesting. It's an example of a street in Amsterdam, where you can see that the bar chart uh, gives the amount of euros that um, uh, a user spends in this street. And you see that the pedestrian uh, by far spends the most amount of money here in this shopping street, but it's giving the least amount of space. And this image really made me think about how are we designing our cities today? And uh, I really believe that something has to change in that. Um, and of course, another big challenge uh, that we're facing is uh, CO2 emissions uh, in cities. Uh, we have to reduce them. It's also a clear goal of the European Union. And I really believe that active modes can also help, uh, help in that. Um, so to summarize uh, what needs to be done, uh, we at Kautapel think this, but also in the European Union, we should in start inverting the mobility pyramid. Right now, our cities are very much planned uh, from a car-oriented perspective. Uh, they're taking quite, uh, quite some space. Uh, I'm not saying that in the future cars cannot be in cities at all, uh, not at all, they can still come there, but I really think we have to change the priorities so cars can still access cities, uh, but we have to really start planning more from a pedestrian point of view and a cyclist point of view. And as I said, I'm not alone in this uh, vision. The European Union is also um, thinking in this direction. Um, in the near future, all bigger cities in Europe have to uh, have these sustainable urban mobility plans or SUMPs. Um, and actually, Gautapel is part of a consortium uh, that is working on different training models in how to uh, implement these SUMPs. Um, and I'm going to talk to you. Um, there's four phases in SUMP planning. I will not bore you with all of them. I'm going to focus on one phase, mostly the strategy uh, development and then specifically on active mode. Um, if you want to know more about SUMPs, please come find me afterwards. Um, but I will briefly touch upon the four phases. Uh, the first one is uh, preparing, analyz uh, analyzing your current situation. So what are the problems that your cities are facing? Um, the next one is to define strategies. And I will touch upon what kind of strategies you can use for active mode. Then, of course, uh, you start developing measures. Uh, and to end, you're going to implement your SUMP. Uh, and this phase is the longest one of all, because monitoring also comes into perspective here. And I think the next presentation will also touch upon that, uh, how data is can be used um, in monitoring as well. So I will, uh, I'm going to try to um, inspire you a bit with some uh, strategies for planning for active modes. Uh, and I think this one is a um, very nice example, moving from there to able to invite. Maybe some of you already know this from a cycling perspective, but I think it also kind of fits uh, with pedestrians. Um, a lot of cities uh, today in Europe as well uh, are very much a dare to cycle environment. Uh, you kind of just wiggle your way around the traffic. Uh, you only see diehard cyclists here. Uh, that's why you see Dutch people cycling when they are on holiday in Europe. They're like, we, we must cycle here. I call them the dare to cycle. They really want to. Um, a lot of cities in, in the Netherlands, uh, but also you have them in Belgium and Germany, some uh, where you've started to see the separated infrastructure. Uh, there are cycle paths everywhere. It is safe to cycle. Uh, there are routes. It's quite comfortable. Uh, that's a very much an able to cycle environment. If you then really want to get cyclists uh, from all ages, from 8 to 80 years old, using uh, the cycle paths, you really have to move towards an invite to cycle environment. And I think some cities in the Netherlands are really uh, working towards these kind of environments, very much attractive places where everyone feels comfortable and safe to cycle, uh, and it's actually fun to do. And I can hear you think, 
uh, I'm originally from Belgium, so I also, when I started working in the Netherlands, I had this same uh, sentence uh, I said many times, uh, Belgian cities are nothing like the Netherlands, but insert any other city in Europe. Uh, our city is nothing like cities in the Netherlands, um, but what I learned uh, from working in the Netherlands is that the, this country has been doing cycling planning for a very long time. So it's a process that's been going on for 50 years. Uh, you see a picture here from protests happening in Amsterdam, demanding safer streets uh, for children. Um, the same kind of protests are happening all over Europe uh, for many years already. So I believe that the Dutch problems from the 70s, they are not unique. Uh, and I believe that the solution should not be either. The principles of uh, designing for active modes that we do in the Netherlands uh, stays the same. But of course, it's important to adapt this to the different situations, um, local situations in cities. And of course, uh, because the Netherlands has been doing this for a while, I also want to encourage you to learn from the mistakes that they made. Um, here you see a bit of over planning for cycling, maybe. Um, you see an example of a street, I think it's also Amsterdam. Uh, very good starting to plan for cyclists, starting to create safe infrastructure, even separated infrastructure in 2010, uh, but kind of forgetting about pedestrians um, and even forgetting about the trees. So this might be very nice and safe to cycle there in 2010, but on a very hot summer day, the trees are all gone. It's not going to be comfortable anymore. Um, so I really want to encourage you learn from these kind of examples. Don't start eating away from um, green from a pedestrian space. So we're all fighting for the same uh, space that is quite limited in cities. Uh, so really plan for active modes uh, in, in an integral way. I want to talk a bit as well about where the potential lies for these active modes, um, mostly on shorter distances. Uh, even in the Netherlands, we still like our cars a lot. This graph shows uh, it's the blue and the, and the red part. Uh, these are all car users on uh, even short distances. You see even up to five, seven and a half, up to 10K. Um, there's still a lot of car trips here uh, that we can replace with um, bikes. And of course, the amount of e-bikes is, uh, is really through the roof. So I believe that also in the bit longer distances, um, we can even have potential for active modes a lot. So there's still a lot of potential that we can still use. And the second one uh, potential lies for me, I think, is the first or a last mile. So a combining mode uh, together. Um, walking or cycling works really well together with public transport. Uh, the main challenge there is make sure that uh, all these um, modalities are connected in a good way. Take away the barriers. If it's not easy to transfer, people are not going to do it. Uh, so really work on integrated planning uh, between these modalities and make sure that transferring is as easy as possible. I would also uh, like to give you, I can give you a long presentation on standards for uh, how wide is the cyclist, how wide does your uh, top rad have to be. Um, but I really believe that a typical pedestrian or a cycling a cyclist does not really exist. Um, I always use the example of myself when I'm walking to work from the, uh, I come from a train and I walk to the office, I want to be fast. Uh, I don't need that much space. But when I'm walking with my uh, baby in a stroller, suddenly I need a double the amount of space and I struggle uh, getting all, on and off uh, sidewalks. And in the evening, I'm walking my border collie who is all over the place on a sidewalk. He, uh, he needs five meters. Um, so I want to say that really think about what situation uh, you are designing for. Um, and that every situation is different. So really start thinking about uh, target groups. And I believe that when you design for active modes, you also get active modes. Two examples, one from Brussels, one from Paris, um, where they really chose to uh, not have that many cars anymore uh, on this street, really uh, change the way the street looks, really plan for active modes. And you see that the usage uh, is through the roof and it goes up. And of course, uh, infrastructure is not all. Uh, it's also about education. You can have a very good infrastructure, but I feel that you also have to educate and promote active modes. And then uh, vulnerable uh, target groups are actually the best uh, places to start. Uh, start with children, young adults. Um, they are very vulnerable in traffic, but they're also the uh, future car users. So basically start early, uh, start them early on using active mode. And you also have the benefit that you kind of educate the parents as well. Uh, and older users, uh, they have a slower reaction time, they have a greater risk of injury, 
Um, and we see that people want to stay active longer, so they participate in traffic as well longer. So that's also a very good target group when you're talking about education on uh, using uh, cycling. And one of the last things I want to talk about is promotion. Uh, it's uh, very nice to um, have uh, like a momentum. It's a, it, what you see here, the picture is a picture of Antwerp, uh, where they're refurbishing the ring road around the, the city. Uh, this was a very, uh, very good moment in time to start targeted marketing to get people on on their bicycles because they were expecting a lot of transit uh, and a lot of traffic. Uh, they used trail passes, test offerings. Uh, they cooperated with employers, and it's it's a really well system. It works quite well. Uh, so a nice example there from promoting for uh, active mode. And then I want to end with my uh, takeaways or my lessons. Uh, what I would like you to remember from this presentation. The potential lies in the short distances, the first and the last mile, that I believe that a typical pedestrian or cyclist does not exist. So think about your target group. Infrastructure is very important. Important, Your basics have to be covered. It has to be safe um, and reliable, but it's not everything. Uh, you have to educate and promote for active mode. Um, don't think that uh, your city cannot do this. Uh, the Dutch problems, they are not unique. Uh, the solution should also not be unique. Uh, you can uh, implement the principles. And the last one, if you design for active mode, I believe you also get active mode. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or contact me later. Thank you, Pascal, for your presentation and showing us not only the challenges, but also the inspiration on how to use in, uh, active mobility and uh, showing us the approaches from SOMS. Um, we're pressing a little bit more for time, so we uh, we like to um, introduce our last speaker, Mirella Peters. She uh, made a presentation with Eelco Kaper, so it's a joint venture on NDW and NTM. But uh, Mirella, I will give you the floor just to uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Pascal told us already something about the challenges of today. Um, in uh, health and accessibility and environment and safety uh, and about inverting the mobility pyramid to increase active modes and because if you design for active modes you get active nodes well after that you get an increase in active modes and that can lead to a congestion as you can see here in the in utrecht in the netherlands uh, before um, a traffic sign um and i've yeah and that's uh to make our cities um, to make sure our cities will stay livable and safe, we need to take appropriate measures and for that a lot of data. And I will tell you a little bit about that part with a focus on bicycle data. Um, I am Mirella, I work as a community manager for the Dutch National Access Point for Mobility Data. Uh, and I made this presentation together with Ilko Kaper from the National Data Portal. Um, so let's start. Uh, with a little bit of bike data, well, in this uh, you, you, in the picture on the right, you see a lot of cycle tracks. Uh, that's all the reds. Uh, for the Netherlands, it's about 35,000 kilometers of cycle track already, and 5,000 kilometer roads with a bike lane. And maybe more impressive, uh, we have 23 million bicycles for 17.2 million people. So most people own more than two bikes, uh, more than one bike. 28% of the trips are by bike, but still more than half of all car journeys cover less than seven and a half kilometers. So there's still some room for improvements, especially if you take that replacing all those short bike trips uh, lower than seven and a half kilometers, that would reduce re emissions with 1.8 megaton of CO2 annually. Um, yeah, improved bike data is the highest priority for NDW partners. Uh, then the use of bicycle data, you can use uh, bicycle data for lots of things and there's lots of uh, bicycle data as well. You have counting data, you have uh, parking data, you have real-time data, etc. But local governments and road authorities will especially use it for traffic models uh, and of course for policy making uh, as well as monitoring the policy. Um, but also for developing new routes, uh, bike parking space and uh, one as well as safety measures. So um, 
the there's an increase in the in the number of accidents for bicycles uh, last year. So that means we have to increase the safety as well on cycling roads. Um, Especially the electric bikes. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's still cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. So the um, so that's a new focus uh, as well, and that's mainly on um, not only on the number of cyclists, but also on the infrastructure data. So you can you and also to connect modalities. Uh, that's also an important one. So you can. Uh, uh, for the first and last mile uh, as well, but you have to connect also with the numbers of cars, etc. So you have a better picture of like the model splits and stuff like that. Uh, then a few examples what you can do with the with different kinds of bicycle data. So if you have counting data, you can determine if there's crowds on routes, as you saw in the first picture, and take measures for new routes as well, uh, or for the be better infrastructure, more comfortable or wider paths, and uh, maybe change the flow at intersections so there's not a long waiting time. Uh, for the infrastructure data, if you collect the infrastructure data for the cycling paths, you can say something about the safety of the routes, uh, because of uh, the width of the path can say something with the number of cyclists on the roads, uh, the difference in speed between the cyclist and car can say something about safety, especially if they're uh, driving next to each other, but also for giving curbs on routes, so it makes it easier to fall down if you hit the curb or not. And also you have the use of cycle infrastructure data to improve routes between cities to make a uh, change in modalities possible. Um, so if you between two cities, you don't have uh, a good enough bicycle track, um, people won't be able to uh, change the car for the bicycle. And the data on bicycle parking, uh, for uh, as well as on street, as off street parking, uh, can be used to realize more parking. So you know, if there's a lot of on street parking, that you have to need a parking space for cyclists, so you can increase room and safety on the pavement for the pedestrians. And that's also important. Well, there's lots of uh, other examples, but these are a few. And uh, I also wanted to say something about standardization of cycling data, because um, when you want to compare between cities or regions or even countries, um, you want to compare it with other modalities as, and you want to compare it with other modalities as well, then you need some kind of standardization to compare it. And in the Netherlands, that's, um, that need has uh, resulted in an extension for counting data uh, on the DATEX2 standardization. Uh, but for Europe as well, I'm also um, Cycling ambassador for NetCore. Um, we are also starting to look for counting, parking, infrastructure, and real time data to find uh, standardization. And that's together with uh, all member states. So we want, we are looking for use cases and share experiences about that before establishing a standard together. So we can also do it across the borders. Um, then a bit about uh, uh, national organizations, because uh, standardization is important if you want to compare the data of one city, region or country to another and to compare with other mod uh, modalities. But it is also important to make the data easy, available, accessible and findable. So every member state has to have national access points to make the data from delegated regulations findable and accessible. And for the Netherlands, uh, we have the uh, the Dutch National Access Point for Mobility Data. But um, we also focus, besides that, on connecting knowledge and data and working together with data portals such as NDW and NWW. Um, so that's, uh, we work together. Uh, so the NDW is the National Road Traffic Data Portal and its focus is mainly on road authorities. Um, and it has um, they are still working on uh, improving the data and the quality and making it more and more available and easy to navigate and update in dashboards. So that's uh, for NDW and NWW, where the National Road Database focuses on more on the uses of geodata. 
And then I quickly look at Eoko if I told it correctly. Or do we have anything else uh, to... Uh... Well, listen, I, I only saw that there was one question from someone from the Netherlands asking ah. about speed pedal so because perhaps we can take that one uh, after you finished your, uh, your bit. But uh, I guess everyone's welcome to talk about uh, NDW uh, at the Intertraffic RPC. So please continue. No questions from my part. Okay. Yeah, then I go already to our three uh, main takeaways. Um, and that is um, that you can organize your expertise and data on a regional and national level. Um, and with that, make the data and applications accessible for everyone. Uh, so everyone, that means uh, like road authorities, cities, uh, regions, um, but also uh, universities uh, or anyone. Uh, furthermore, make the bicycle as important as the car in expertise and space, but also data. Uh, so we have already a lot of data on cars, uh, and now we have to also collect them for cyclists to improve. And of course, more cyclists means new problems. Um, so anticipate on these problems by collecting those data, monitoring those cyclists so you can invest in time in infrastructure and safety. So, um, yeah. If you have any questions, um, we will also be at uh, the NTM and the NDW will be at the uh, Intertraffic as well. So you can also look us up or email uh, Ilko or me if you have any questions later on. Thanks, Mirella and Ilko, for your insights on the use of data and the examples you you um, you, you gave. Um, Wim, I know you've got a question, but because of the time frame, I would like to wrap up this uh, webinar. And uh, please contact uh, Mirella and Pascal by email or via me. That's also fine as well. Um, so time to wrap up uh, this webinar and today's uh, presentations and speakers has shed a little light on the imperative, the need for policy framework to integrate uh, various facets such as official spatial utilization, the charging infrastructure and the mobility uh, modalities for a cohesive, sustainable approach. Um, and in essence, these presentations underscore the significance of a proactive policy making uh, and data driven making uh, 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 solutions to navigate through these times. So thank you all for contribu contribu contributing to this um, discussion. And of course, a very, very special welcome. Uh, uh, thank you to our speakers. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Hans, for uh, uh, being this, just for the questions after Martin's presentation. Job, Jose, Pascal, uh, Mirella, and um, um, uh, Ilko for giving us um, uh, um, some insights. Um, we said ag uh, again and again, uh, all these members are on the Intertraffic booth on the Connect Pavilion as well at Intertraffic. So if you've got any questions left, uh, ask them on the email, but it's also a warm invitation just to join us uh, on our Connect Pavilion uh, at Intertraffic Amsterdam from April 16th or April, April the 19th. So hope you to see you there or on our coming webinar on hubs, stomp, scenarios and mobility. Uh, thanks again. Have a lovely Tuesday uh, uh, a morning and working day. Uh, looking forward to meet you, meeting up again. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.